I feel home uh, because that is our home, our common home is, I think, Austrian, uh, uh, Czech Republic, so to say, and the history. And when you go through uh, Olomouc, you always feel like being in Vienna or vice versa. So that's really something. Theresa has been here, Mozart has been here, etc., etc. Et so, and now Wolfgang Wintner has been here. No. <laughs> no, it's not the first time that I'm here, and I'm really glad uh, that we have this, I think, many years now uh, collaboration. Many of the students from here spent some months in my lab in Vienna, and they built friendship uh, which still holds till now until today, and I hope also in the future. Yeah, and uh, when I was actually invited uh, to this talk, uh, I didn't know exactly uh, what I am uh, expecting. So I would like to dedicate, of course, this talk to Professor Zaratnik. Maybe it's uh, mispronounced, but, and I think I would also say, because there is some connections to the topics I'm going to speak today, and that is the recognition in in the eminent uh, contribution to achievement of molecular recognition, molecular uh, uh, understanding physical chemical properties of molecules and how molecules talk to each other. And I will talk about this, how molecules talk to each other in order to make an enzyme separation. I think that's the, the essence of my presentation here. So, chirality, because I, I probably have to say a few words because not everybody is in the field. And when you see that, calority means handiness. And there are some informations already in this slide. And the information is, these are the hands of my friends, and these are my hands. And what you see here is an imaginary mirror images. So we have two mirror imaging objects here. They behave like enantiomers when you say it for molecules, but they can also be mirror images of objects. And this is a very long standing that you have mirror images of objects. Nature does that. And also human beings does that. That means also in, in cultural science, if you have columns, you have a, a Spiegelmeer, so to, so to say. And this is a word which comes from Germany, but it's used also in English. Spiegelmeer means there's a mirror image and you have two images of those. So the point here is that we have here these mirror images and break it down to the molecular level, to the molecules, these images may talk to each other on a molecular level. So molecules talk to each other. That's the, the message here. Coming to the mirror images, what does that mean? You have to have planes of symmetry. Planes of symmetry means that you have some planes of symmetry. You know what that is? This is a frog looking out of a pond. So, this is actually the symmetry of this object, of the frog, and this is the symmetry of the mirror image, of the plane. So that tells us that is always happening, and there are some biological reasons also for that, that we have this uh, symmetry here, and that, that you can see uh, uh, more in space and so forth. So this is actually what we are dealing with. Uh, and I am going to now to the details, and I break it down now to the molecule level. And the molecular level is, that we have, of course, stereogenic centers. And this is the most common chirality. So here's the mirror image, and there are two chiral molecules, and they behave like mirror images, and this is the so-called chiral center. And we call them enantiomers. But for objects, we don't really call them enantiomers. We call them spiegelmers. And in principle, you could also have spiegelmeric proteins. If you have a a protein, an enzyme, which digests something, and it's all built of L amino acids. You can artificially make a protein with all D amino acids, and they will have just a reversal of selectivity, of biological selectivity. So that's a fundamental uh, thing which we have here. I don't uh, want to go too much into details. The point is, we have these various type of chiral elements, and I will show you why that's important. This one is becoming more tricky now these type of elements. We have rotaxans, motors, motors, chemical motors, and we have actually now separated these chiral motors because they can uh, make this type of rotation or this type of rotation uh, along an axis. So that's also spiegelmeers or enantiomers. Chiral knotans. You have, we also have worked with these molecules. They are chiral, and you can actually use them. There's no chiral center in it, only the object is chiral. The same applies also for helicity. 
chiral helical structures. They can be on a molecular level, but also on a polymeric level. They can be chiral. And that means we have chiral cavities inside these cavities. So they have different conformation there and configuration there. And chiral ca cavities is a, an essence here. So we have chiral cavities, something which is not in the textbook written in. In the textbook is always chiral element, but we have chiral cavities somehow, a space filling. And they can be uh, right or left-handed. And we have, of course, the chiral footprints. That is something like them. You can make a, a footprint of a chiral object, and then it becomes selective. This is chirality from a biological point of view. Now, you build DNA is, is chiral. You build an object like this, like these snails here. Millions, billions of these snails are uh, in the Earth. That means all fossilies, etc. They all are left helical. But there are some rare objects where they are right helical. So without knowing why that actually happens, this biology, uh, I would say a spontaneous uh, situation, and you find them in Australia somewhere on the beach. I didn't find them. Uh, you, you have this spontaneous, so that means biological chirality. And this is not really discovered yet why, we, why this can happen spontaneously. Also, the, the, the molecules which are building this, uh, this, this object are still the same. So there is a secondary, a tertiary structure over it, which actually forms this type of chirality. And it has implication then for later on in, in the thing. Now, excuse me. Now, let's talk about the, the concept, how to separate in answers. And the concept is very simple. The concept is you have to make a diastereomeric intermediate somehow. Because diastereomeres are, from a physical chemical point of view, different in energy and so forth, as in properties. So what we do is, we take a so-called chiral selector, so we need a source which is chirally defined. And then our analytes have to go into contact with that, forming a diastereomeric associate. And the diastereomeric associates, you are forming it with the R, uh, and we call them selectants and selector R and S, they are forming diastereomeric associates. And because they are diastereomeric, they are energetically different, and that means you can separate it by any type of physical chemi chemical separation techniques. That means crystallization, chromatography, distillation, whatever you think, you can do that. It's a fundamental principle. Now, when we go to chromatography, what we do is that we immobilize this chiral selector onto a surface, onto a chromatographic surface. Then we have a so-called chiral stationary phase. So that's what we do. And the relation, what the selectivity is, the stereoselectivity is, it's actually the difference of, of the binding energy. So delta, delta G, the difference of the binding energy, these are the binding constants, is directly related to the stereoselectivity. So we have actually a tool to work with it. We only have to find out uh, what's, what's around, and what we see immediately is there's a temperature dependence. There's maybe a temperature dependence, and we have to uh, watch that uh, carefully. Now, when we talk at, at the beginning, say, molecules talk to each other. When the molecules talk to each other in chromatography means in liquid chromatography, we have a, a tro troika, as I always say, with the Carl selector, the Carl selectant, and via the mobile phase, they make these intermolecular interactions. And this intermolecular interaction is now based on the chemistry of these compounds. What can interact? What type of functional groups or decoration of a molecule can interact with each other, also in a spatial uh, environment? So that means we have to have these molecular forces. We have to think about the molecular forces. So, and the molecular forces are most uh, uh, prominent are actually the electrostatic interactions. What do I mean with electrostatic interaction? They can be different in, also in strengths. So that means anion cationic interaction, a strong uh, electrostatic interaction. Hydrogen donor, hydrogen acceptor, pi acid, pi base, dipole, dipole, induced dipoles, and hydrophobic fit. What does that mean? That means with the solvatation or solvation. So that means actually a molecule is not by itself, it's always solvated. And when they get interacting, so this molecule is solvated, this is solvated, when they come together and they want to make this complex, they have to desolvate. 
to dissolvate and in chromatography, and then it builds the associate. And when it dissociates, then it can move chromatographically. So solvation is a very strong effect and has to be uh, considered. So th this is something we, we often ignore, actually, uh, but that's the same also in reverse trace chromatography or whatever. That's a principle here. And we, we should also think we have not talked about it, but we can talk for a long time, the molecular dynamics and the conf conformational adaption of a molecule. So a molecule adapt to each other. So that gets energy in a low uh, energy form. And, of course, uh, uh, there is a distribution factor. It can be attraction, but also repulsion. Is an information to separate something. Attraction is a one one force, but repulsion is also a force to separate something. Now, when we come to, to these forces, we have to classify the forces. What is actually the energy of these forces? Because in chromatography, we have to deal with that. We have to cope with these energies that we can actually uh, move down a molecule through the column, so to elute it. And therefore, we classify that. And of course, uh, for ionic strong electrostatic interaction, ionic interaction is a very strong one. It can be non-directed or directed. If it's directed, then it's hydrogen bonding supported. So we come to this hydrogen bonding. So we have non-directed and directed forces and different strengths of these, of these forces. And they all play a role in forming this discriminative uh, diastereomeric associate. And we want to use that. And that is the concept. We don't really want to use just or take 10 or 20 different uh, chiral columns and, and screen them. We also want to understand why this compound and that compound can be resolved and the other one cannot be resolved. As I said before, these forces are triggered via the medium. In the gas phase, we don't have that. That means GC enantiomer separation has only stationary phase and the analyte. Mobile phase is inert, has no contribution on the selectivity. Liquid phase has a contribution. So we have to think about it. But I stay with liquid phase only. Now, when we go now to this medium, liquid phases, we characterize the liquid phases. And we know that also from textbooks. We have apolar phases and we have protic phases, we have non-protic phases, polar, non-polar, etc. We have to characterize them. That means the electric constants, uh, hydrogen bonding uh, capacity, and so on. And I think you have heard already a talk. Then we have this new development, so to say, supercritical fluid conditions. That means CO2 is considered a non-polar solvent, but, super, uh, but CO2 mixed with polar solvents, and surprisingly, they can freely be mixed with methanol, ethanol, and, and, and so forth. Uh, then you have a new solvent, and we don't really characterize yet what is the property of this solvent mixture. That is really relatively unclear yet. We'll come to that. So, hydrogen bond. And this is the most important bond, I think, in chemistry anyhow. And also in, in chromatography, and that means also in enantioselective chromatography. What is actually the property of, of this hydrogen bonding? So you have to have a, a proton donor, and you have to have an acceptor. They have to be in both groups, or intramolecular can also be the, the case, because then it's forming uh, the conformation of this molecule. It's very important for the folding of proteins, etc. They form hydrogen bonds in aqueous environment. So therefore, it's only a question how close they can come. So this is the hydrogen bonding. And we are using this hydrogen bonding uh, because it has directional character. And directional is always like this. So it, it, the orientation is actually fixed of this interaction. If you would have a non-directional interaction, you cannot really fix it in space. So therefore, you need directional forces. And this is why hydrogen bonding has such an eminent, I think, uh, contribution in chemistry, in every type of chemistry you can think of. So, and that is a protic solvent, and so it has also a proton transfer reaction, like here. So this is uh, essential. Now coming to the chromatography, that means now we have classified all the solvents. We can classify what is now the effect of these solvents for the bondings of two molecule types. So that means if there is ionic interaction, you have to have a counter ion to break this bonding. To break this bonding. So that means ion exchange chromatography, you, have, you always have to have some salt in the mobile phase to break that. Hydrogen bonding, you probably have to have a protic solvent which breaks hydrogen bonding. So therefore, we can classify that. Pi-pi interaction, you have to have something in the mobile phase which breaks pi-pi interaction. 
Acetonitrile is breaking pi pi interaction. Methanol is not breaking pi pi interaction. And that has a large difference also in selectivity, as we have heard during our the, the talks here. There is a difference whether you use uh, methanol or acetonitrile due to these uh, different interactions here. And of course, we have the hydrophobic interaction and the polarity of the solvent uh, plays a role due to the solvation and solvatation. Now, go further. As I said before, we immobilize this chiral selector to a su support material and we call this chiral stationary phase. This chiral stationary phase goes now, interacts now with the chiral selectants. They have the stability constants here, it's described by the bonding energy. So that's the thermodynamic terms. And the thermo thermodynamic terms, this alpha, is somewhat directly correlated not only from the binding strength, also from the chromatographic alpha value, selectivity value. So the chromatographic selectivity value is actually the bonding strength and the phase ratio. So, and as you see here, we have enthalpic and entropic terms which control selectivity. So it's getting relatively complicated. Only the temperature dependence is not so complicated, but the entropic contribution, it's really getting complicated. And we make some, some assumptions here. And the assumptions here is that the temperature is kept constant throughout the chromatographic bed. Pressure does not play a role in these molecular interactions. That's an assumption. And when you think about UPLC with 1,000 bars or so forth, it's not true anymore. Absolutely not true. And that has been found several times when you, when you chromatograph proteins. Proteins have changed their conformation whether you go with low, low pressure or high pressure. So therefore, uh, that should not be ignored, and that means also that you cannot transfer the methods so easily from low pressure to high pressure due to that uh, thing. And we have make also a, a, an, a, an assumption that retention due to non-stereoselective interaction is minimum. Otherwise, <coughs> this equation would not really be true. And that's the answer for that. The answer for that is that what we observe chromatographically, the retention factor, is a contribution of the stereoselective retention and of the non-stereoselective retention. And if alpha is actually, now we have the, non, the stereoselective and the non-stereoselective. If this term becomes big, alpha becomes very small. And you think there is no molecular recognition behind that. But that's totally misleading. Because this one is too big. This term is too big. So that means it's not so simple that from a chromatographic alpha, you can directly conclude what is the molecular recognition in space. So therefore, we have to control that. That means we need to keep this term very small, or at least we have to understand how big it is. And that has a consequence. The consequence is, if we have a low alpha value to make a separation, we need many plates, many chromatographic plates. This is that, uh, the famous resolution term. When you want to make, uh, resolve two peaks, you can do it with high efficiency, you can do it with selectivity and retention. You keep that more or less constant because uh, above 10 is absolutely useless. Here you have, I think, limitations, so we can only work on that. So selectivity, selectivity is the term. So that means if you have a very low alpha, you need very high plate number. In liquid chromatography, we cannot reach very, very high plate numbers like in GC. So therefore, we have limitations here. In order to overcome the limitations, because we want to also want to make preparative separation, we have to work on the selectivity term. So that if you mean if you have a selectivity term 100, you don't need chromatography. You make one extraction, one plate, and you have the enantiomers separated, in principle. It's very difficult to get 100. Biology has 100. That means enzymes and so forth. They make their selective reaction with such a high alpha value. So therefore, we try to mimic it to a certain extent. So chromatography can mimic also biological processes. So that, that's the key here. That's what I wanted to tell you here. That we Usually, we work down here. That means we have to have these high plate numbers or to work with alpha. Now, going to the alpha. Selectivity triangle. The selectivity triangle says us that we have the analyte, the chemical structure of the analyte, chemical structure of the stationary phase, so they have to interact, and the mobile phase will trigger that, these interactions. So that's, uh, I would say, that's really the, the magic selectivity triangle. 
Now coming to the mobile phase, we can classify the mobile phase. Now going for the reversed phase chromatography and 80% is reversed phase chromatography. What is the key here? The key is stationary phase is an alkyl chain. There is no chemical information in that, mo in that chain. And the mobile phase is hydroorganic. So that means we have only a selectivity window and we cannot really change that much. Very little. We are, we are limited in there. So the window, selectivity window is not very big. Due to this, I think, uh, relatively simple uh, chemistry of the alkyl chain here. So selectivity. However, hydrophobicity is a very, I think, fine term that you can really adjust your retention. But for chirality, it's absolutely not possible because we need a chiral source here. So we make, make now normal phase chromatography. And in former days, we had normal phase chromatography. But normal phase chromatography with silica usually. Now we have silica modified phases. So that means we have the stationary phase and we have a huge variety of stationary phases. V variety of, of chemical bonding on the stationary phase. And that's quite important. And I'll tell you why. Because we are trying and more and more industry is going to normal phase chromatography using supercritical fluid chromatography because it's much faster, much cheaper, etc., etc. But the, we are not prepared for that. So they want to mimic actually and get rid of reversed phase going to normal, normal phase. But that can only be done if you have a large, uh, I, th I think, toolbox of different stationary phases with different chemistry in that. So bottom line is selectivity window is very broad. And this is actually the future, at least for preparative chromatography. That means also purification of natural product, etc., and synthesis product, uh, whatever. Organic chemists usually doesn't make a pure compound. They give you a garbage. They are always surprised how many impurities in there. <laughs> and I have good relationship with organic chemists, but <laughs> I often have to tell them the truth. Now. As I said, now we have the diversity of the stationary phase, diversity of, of chemistry. So that means a diversity of the Carl selectors. Carl selectors mean a diversity, uh, and here we can have all kinds of Carl molecules. That means polymers, macromolecules, cyclodextrin. I think that was an invention here also in this country from Eva Smolkova. Uh, she's probably not in the audience here, but I think I really, she, she really deserves the credit for that. Bioaffinity system. And then we have low molecular systems. And now I'm there where I wanted to be, ion exchange chromatography. So it's only a niche from the whole, whole field of possibilities to make enantiomer separations. And I'll try to come back because ion chromatography means that we are dealing only with analytes which have ionic interactions. Here's a cartoon. That means ionic uh, uh, chromatography, that means we have a charge, this is an anion exchanger, so you have positive charge on the Carl selector, and the analyte is negatively charged. So they have an electrostatic interaction here, and of course you have to have some additional information that you can make an enantiomer separation. You can make the same thing here. As you see, you make a cation exchanger, so the selector has to be negatively charged, and the analyte is positively charged. So in principle, a very simple concept. But in reality, it's probably not so simple to build such molecules. This is a historic slide. We selected quinine. Quinine, and there were some reasons for selecting quinine. Quinine is a natural compound. Quinine and quinidine behave pseudoenantiomerically. What does that mean? Pseudoenantiomerically means that you can probably, uh, the, the conformation, and you can shift the elution order. But why is that only? Quinine has five stereogenic centers. One, two, three are constant in their configuration. And only two of those, eight and nine, are flexible. So you have 8R, 9S, or 8S, 9R, like you see here. And these conformation, and they have restricted rotation around these two single bonds. And that actually builds a chiral pocket, so to say, a chiral pocket around that here. It's cheap. And one key point was why we uh, selected quinine. It has a chiral nitrogen. And the chirality of the nitrogen is fixed because this molecule is fixed in a three in the quinaglutine ring here. It's fixed in this ring. It cannot flop. So that it stays, it's a chiral element here. 
And the curl element should usually be as close as possible to the curl interaction site. And we can make lots of chemistry around that. I am not going into too much detail here. Uh, I'll show you one or the other example. Now we immobilize this quinine to a stationary phase. We make thiol uh, chemistry here and so forth. We immobilize quinine. In it recognize this analyte, for instance, in the illusion order S before R. That means the S is weaker bound than the R. R plus quinine selector is stronger bound and it is reflected in longer retention time. Now we introduce uh, a chemical bond here. We make a carbamate out of that. No extra chirality into that. We just have modified, uh, I think, the space around this binding pocket. And this is what people always do when they make uh, improve a, a drug or a drug compound or whatever. They improve actually the binding sites around that. So that's what we did. We improved that, the binding site. But what is the, the surprise? First, we have a large enantioselectivity, but reversed of evolution order. So that means we have changed the binding site, and we have changed the interaction sites. The interaction sites we have changed because we have moved the hydrogen bonding site from this OH uh, two bonds further. And we have a hydrogen acceptor and donator. So that's a different. And this is actually the key, what we actually figured out then, and we have worked uh, many, many different uh, subjects here. Just to explain, this is the commercial phase actually from quinine and from quinidine, and they have reversed elution order, only due to the swamp of the eight and nine configuration of that molecule. The others stay constant, which is a surprise. Oops, I don't know. Yeah, we'll see. Okay. So, then we make chemistry again. We optimize the stereo environment, the bulk phase, around this bonding pot pocket. That means we have decoration on it. We call it decoration. We have made decoration outside. You think that's very far outside of this bonding uh, pocket here, of this chiral cavity. And we have made also space filling here. And what is the result? We can get for a certain analyte a very high alpha value. Very high alpha value. This is, for instance, uh, 88. But we have also examples of a of, uh, couple of hundred. So extreme, but it works only for one compound. It's almost like nature. It works for one compound. So it's, it's substrate selective, so to say. So therefore, we have optimized that. But what is the consequence if you optimize something? Of course, you could use that now for preparative separation very nicely, by extraction and so forth. But for chromatography, we have to think about that. What is the implication? of the chiral purity of such a substance, of such a chiral selector. What is the consequence? The consequence is, and that's as astonishing, you would see, that you can, of course, model and, and, and calculate. If you have a small alpha value of a chiral selector, and you have an impurity of maybe 2%, chiral impurity, so that means the other enantiomer in this selector, you would not figure out any major change of selectivity of that phase. Very few, very, very little. If you do that with a very high alpha value, 2% enantiomeric purity, you you're half your enantioselectivity. So that's major what you do here. So therefore, it's, it's extremely important that you know the, uh, the purity and don't make, and then I always uh, advocate that, don't make theory around something if you haven't controlled something like that. It's, and you, uh, the literature is full of these uh, speculations. This is uh, very important. It probably has also effect on the, on the stereoselective catalysis, etc., etc. So therefore, I think we really should pay attention on that. Now, we know now we have electrostatic interaction. Base and acid. Everybody knows if you have that, you can make a crystal, in theory. In practice, you, most of the time, you don't have a crystal. You just have some, some garbage here. We were lucky. So we had these crystals. This is the curl selector. This is the curl selectant, so to say. Now we could figure out there's this electrostatic interaction. We have supporting hydrogen bonding and supportive pi pi interaction. So perfect. Perfect interaction. And this gave us the high alpha values. But I wanted to uh, draw your, your attention now to, to the uh, uh, reciprocity principles. Reciprocity principles, we had two reciprocity principles already. 
One is if you change the chiral selectivity of the phase, so you make an enantiomeric phase, you get a reversal of elution order. Now we make reciprocity from a chemical point of view for the functional groups. Here's the base, here's the acid. So that's actually, if that's immobilized, we have a Carl anion exchanger. Now if we go around, immobilize this molecule, we have a Carl cation exchanger, and that should recognize this molecule. Very clear, it's a very clear concept, so to say. And you have to follow that consequently, also with synthesis. So this is actually the structure of chirality or molecular recognition reciprocity. And we did that consequently. So that means we separated with our quinine phases this acid on a prep scale. Then if once they are separated, we immobilize them, and then we have a Carl cation exchanger. And prove that principle. Very simple. So that's actually a very straightforward idea. And uh, then we proved it. Here's the separation of bases. Perfect. Separation of a, it's a Carl cation exchanger based on ionic interaction between the sulfonic acid site and the amino site here, and the amino site. And you see a perfect selectivity here. And we have screened hundreds of compounds along that line. So the principle was, was true. Oops. Now we go further. Now we have a cation exchanger and an anion exchanger. Now the question comes up when we make an amphrolytic selector. Amphrolytic selector means that within one molecule we have a positive charge site and a negative charge site. That's just in a cartoon. What can that do? That can react the positive site with an anion, the negative site with a cation. And this, if you have two charges on one molecule, it may interact simultaneously with an amphrolytic compound. And this has to be proven. Now, we know already we had our molecules. This was the cation exchanger. Then we clipped off this carbamate group and hooked down this uh, amino sulfonic acid. Now we made this amphrolytic compound here. So sulfonic acid side, amino side. So that's a weak anion exchanger strong cation exchanger, so weak, strong, uh, a sweet ionic or amphalytic uh, analyte. So, what is the consequence for that? The consequence is, as we said before, it should act as a cation exchanger or as an anion exchanger. This is a molecule, this has also been commercialized now, and it should work probably for sweet ionic analytes. And this is why we call these columns Swix columns. It's probably a German term but at least some Americans can speak it well. Now we make the proof again. It works for the separation of acids. It works for the separation of, of, uh, of amines. And it works for the separation of amphalytic compounds. So that was a proof of principle. So it was a separation of, for instance, proline, beta amino acids, tryptophan, and even peptides you could separate. So that means the principle holds two ionic interaction sites plus information of uh, steric information plus hydrogen bonding, et cetera, et cetera. And I'll come to that point a little later. That this uh, principle is general, you can also say that now you can separate carboxylic acid, sulfonic acid, phosphonic acid, all the same structure. So that means the principle holds. I think that was... Uh, uh, well done. So this is actually a slide in col uh, collaboration we do with uh, uh, Professor Antal Peter in, in Seget and, and Istvan. Uh, and, and we do lots of amino acid uh, uh, screening and separations. And this is a beta-2 amino acids, for instance. Separation of beta-2 amino acids. This is how it looks like. Of course, this is a molecule which has no aromatic interaction site. So it can only be charged or maybe some hydrophobic interaction. Here we probably have, but I say only probably have, have pi pi type of interaction. It actually was not advantage from that one. So alpha was lower here than here in this case. So the steric increment is much more important than, than the others. And this is a very important uh, question. This is pregabalin. Uh, this is a drug. This is a drug and it's a GABA, gamma amino acid. So that means we have here the carboxylic acid on the gamma side here's the amino group. So we have removed the distance from the interaction sites. 
quite a bit. We can nicely separate the racemid, but that doesn't count too much, only for PrEP separation. What counts in, in, in pharmaceutical industry that you can make enantiomeric excess analysis. Enantiomeric excess analysis means that you can detect maybe 0.1% enantiomeric impurity in the main compound. So that means this, co this column tolerates that. It holds, the principle holds also, because you always think that reverse trace can only do that. That's not true. Ion exchanger can do that very well. Also, Carl ion exchanger can do that very well. And uh, the point I'd like to make is that you can do that also with, uh, uh, because it has no uh, uh, aromatic group here, you need to have special detectors, evaporative light uh, dete uh, uh, scattering detector, or mass spectrometry, because the conditions are as such that they tolerate mass spectrometry, so you can easily make that with mass spectrometry. And this is also, that's also from a study which was done in, in Germany. As we said, this, this complex can also detect acids and bases simultaneously. So that means that can retain both. In reverse phrase, you would not do that. Either it retains the acid or it retains the base, depending on the pH. Here you can do both here. So that means this is, uh, uh, th is mefloquine. This is an anti-cancer anti drug, and that was given to 800 pregnant women in Africa. And they wanted to find out what is the metabolism rate and what is the pharmacokinetic rate. So, and this is actually the basic uh, analytics here. Biological samples, this one is a biological sample, that means here are the enantiomers of the parent drug, and this is the metabolite. The metabolite is this one, is non-chiral, but an acid. This is a base, so you can simultaneously do that, and that simplifies extremely. We have validated this technique, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, it has already been published uh, this methodology, but it tells you the stability of the column is strong, and and the molecular recognition is strong. Here's something very strange: Batman peaks. Very awful. When you get that, my my student was really shocked. And she got these type of peaks, and we didn't understand that. Now we, I think we, 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 we know what we have, and we have published that. What I would like to show here is that we make enantiomer separation of a proline. Proline, proline, DD and LL. And one peak pair looks like this. DD and LL. What can be the reason for that? It's not an enantiomer separation, it's a rotomer separation. And the rotomer separation comes from this. This bond here, it can be cis or it can be trans here. Cis and trans, cis and trans. So that means also there's no chiral element, but it's a rotomer. So therefore you can stabilize that also during your chromatographic process. And during your chromatographic process, you have also an interconversion of the one rotomer to the other rotomer, and you end up with peaks like that. So if you now increase temperature, for instance, or decrease temperature, you can make this uh, transformation rate faster or slower. So that means there's a temperature, strong temperature dependence. And when you increase uh, retention here, these Batman peaks, or I call it kitty cat, you get one, uh, one uh, single uh, peak here, and we have made many, many, many of those. That means, in principle, all peptides which have on the C-terminus proline have this actually property here. And that has, again, a, a fundamental biological consequence here. And we have to think about that. And we can mimic that now with our systems. And this is a very nice, I think, uh, development here. Now let's talk uh, at the end, uh, more or less, about the mechanistic aspects. As said, it's ion exchange chromatography. Ion exchange chromatography is controlled by the salt. Here it's a little bit more complicated. It's controlled, so that the retention of the R and the S is controlled by the phase ratio, that means how much uh, the, uh, the phase ratio is, the stability constants, how much of selector is bound. If you have no selector on that, you won't get any retention, that's clear. We have, uh, it depends on the ionization rate of the analyte and the selector. And it depends on the concentration of a counter ion in the mobile phase. So that means we can control the retention, 
This one is more or less constant. We can keep that constant with the concentration of the counter ion. What is the, conce what is the consequence for that? The consequence is, and here is an example, same formula, we separate this compound here, that, that's benzoyl uh, leucine. We get, um, when you make a log-log plot, you see that the retention is dependent on the concentration of the reversal of the concentration of the counter ion of the salt concentration. So you can control where this peak is coming in the chromatogram, totally control, and alpha is not affected. So alpha stays, so the selectivity stays constant, and, alpha, and, and uh, and the retention is so. So what tells us that, conceptually? Ionic interaction, if it's a single interaction, is not stereoselective. It needs additional interaction sites. So that tells us that immediately if you make this type of, of, of uh, experiments. So let's summarize that. An answer selectivity of an ion exchange mechanism is multi you need multiple interactions to discriminate in isomers, we know that, uh, we have uh, several. So we have an, a primary interaction site which controls retention, particularly maybe for the first peak, for K1. This is electrostatic, it can be attractive or repulsive, and then you need additional interaction site, that means hydrogen bonding, pi pi stacking, hydrophobic interaction, and so forth. So actually the second peak we have to watch, not the first one, the second has to be watched. So let's uh, summarize that, can also Ion exchange B chromatography be used in supercritical fluid conditions. We know now supercritical fluid conditions are have non-polar CO2 plus a polar a solvent. And I think we have to maybe I have go one. No, I, I cannot. I have put that out. The point I'd like to make is that we have uh, we call that counter ion, this X minus, but we could term it also more generally and call it displacer. It displaces the molecule on this interaction site. It's more general. So therefore we should r rather talk about displacement chromatography. So that means for an ion exchanger, we know that we need a, a, a dissociated acid, the deprotonated acid, so to say, as a counter ion, as a displacer. So, also an acid can work as a displacer. Only being the acid, because what, what is happening if you have a, 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 a neutral base and a neutral acid in solution, what is doing, what is doing? They are forming a salt by protonating the proton, uh, the amine, and deprotoning the acid. And that means that you don't need an extra counter ion, extra acid would already be enough to have a different kinetics of this binding form, uh, forming of ion pairs in this solution. So therefore, acid can also be a displacer. Uh, pure acid can be a displacer. And the same, of course, call, uh, uh, is, is true for the amines. So you have an amine as a counter ion, and it's a displacer. Now we ask that, can we use that also now under these conditions? And we have made now an amino acid, an amphoteric compound, under supercritical fluid conditions, and the supercritical fluid condition, that's the separation of tryptophan, and we titrate it. So we, we, we diluted the mobile phase uh, uh, all the time. We started with methanol and some buffer in it, and diluted it with uh, supercritical fluid, uh, with supercritical CO2. So we diluted the buffer strength, and we changed the solvent property overall. It did not have much effect on the selectivity here for tryptophan, it only increased retention because we decreased the buffer strength. So it's just normal. But then we tested it also for other compounds. We tested it for, for tryptophan, you see that here? More or less alpha selectivity stays constant. Then we made N-acetyl tryptophan, that means for the acid. For the acid, also more or less constant. And then we had mefloquine, which is a base. And the base has a strong effect on the composition of the mobile phase. We don't really understand yet why we have such a strong effect here, uh, but this is some, a, a surprise for that. So that means also, you cannot transfer so easily a method from, from normal phase, uh, to a, uh, from reverse phase chromatography to, to a normal phase chromatography, or to supercritical fluid condition. It would not work. So that is a, a very interesting 
observation, and then I think you have heard, seen already that slide, what is actually causing, under supercritical fluid conditions, <laughs> CO2 reacts, of course, with methanol, forming an acid, and this acid can be a displacer, as we have seen before. So if we have a displacement chromatography, also under supercritical fluid condition, and if you would have an additional amine in it, you have even a salt. You have a salt. That is also, of course, a displacer. CO2 reacts also with water. Again, you have an acid, and you can also have a, a salt. And CO2 reacts also with an amine. Doesn't need a proton. With an amine, it's a carbamic, carbamic acid, uh, and a salt of a carbamic acid. So you always in create in situ a displacer. And this is something, I think, which is fundamental. And this is actually one of the, of the advantages of supercritical fluid of chromatography, which has been ignored for many, many years that you are forming this in situ. And as soon as you depressurize it, they disappear, these components. They evaporate, they disappear. So therefore, it's an ideal thing uh, for preparative separation. Now let's come uh, to, to the end. What are the features of Carl ion exchanges type? As we have said, retention is primarily based on ionic interactions, so ion pairing. Stoichiometric displacement model functions. What does that mean? You actually, you can play, if you're in, a, in an optimum case, a one-to-one -one salt formation. So that means highest, highest loadability of such a column is possible in principle. Retention is as tunable via pH, the protonation and so forth, type of buffer salts, polar organic and hydroorganic mobile phases can be used, SFC conditions can be used, and SWIX works as anion, cation, and sweet ionic ion exchanger. So we have done a lot. A final remark. The chromatographic resolution of enantiomers has changed from an art to routine. I started 78 with enantiomer separation. It was an art at that time. And we were extremely proud. Now body, almost everybody can separate everything. These uh, amphalytic compounds were the last remaining niche of compounds which could not be resolved with this polymeric phases uh, based on polysaccharides. So that's a niche due to the high polarity of that molecule. So therefore that was a niche. So that means uh, it has matured thanks to pioneering work and I don't go into detail. There were lots of people and it started in the 70s. Now you can buy it and you can solve everything. So that means it's over. Is it really over? For me, as I'm an emeritus, for me it's over, more or less. Also, I have now external collaboration, so it's not over. So we continue, but I can't make any synthetic work anymore. So what's coming next? Preps separation. So that is actually what's done now in industry. On the multi-ton scale, you make an enzyme separation. Hopefully also for amino acids, but it's not there yet. But the money which we brought belongs to the university, of course, not to me. University owns the patents. We have also everything patented, so, but, but that's a normal rule. So, but this is my final slide here from, from an intellectual point of view. I'm still extremely intrigued about chirality as a subject. Chirality is a key subject in chemistry, everywhere in chemistry, whether it's organic chemistry, it's analytical chemistry, it's physical chemistry, everything. You want to understand the mechanism of selectivity. And this is, I think, will remain. And that will remain. And this, the chorality is driving players and it will remain a central role. So chorality-driven science. And therefore, we have this chorality conference series, etc., cetera, chorality medal. And there are lots of, not a lot, but several Nobel Prizes have been given for chorality, particular if you think about the catalysis and so forth. Whole Europe is working on an anti-selective catalysis. You have to understand that on the one side, and you have to have the tools to measure it. So therefore, I think that's the, uh, the implication we have here. Uh, and, uh, and by this, I would like to just to acknowledge, of course, uh, the University of Vienna and some industry partners, and many, many, many collaborators I had over, over the years. As I stated, I started 78 in America, uh, when I was with Barry Carger in, in Boston. 
And uh, particularly, I would like to, uh, to give credit to, to Lemma and the Maya group. And of course, here now we have lots of collaborations here and lots of students. I don't go into detail. They all earn all the credit. I'm just sitting on, on the desk. No, not only on the desk. I also go through the labs and watch them, what they are doing. Uh, but uh, they all deserve my thanks. And I also thank you very much for your attention. And I hope you had some inspiration what I did over the years. Thank you very much.